Well, first of all, Happy New Year. For those of you who don't know, Advent is actually the beginning of the new liturgical calendar for the church. So we, we are a little early than the rest of folks out there uh, in celebrating our new year. But this morning, I wanted to bring in a string of Christmas lights. Uh, yesterday, I got the fun job of going out on the ladder and trying to figure out how am I going to wrap all these lights around my front porch so that they don't get all bunched up in one spot and barely shine in another. And let me tell you, I took a few a leave after that. But <laughs> as I was doing so, I felt a little bit like Clark Griswold. If you remember the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, when he is, is thinking, oh, I'm finally done. I've got all my lights up, my decorations are ready, and then he plugs them in and nothing. Well, this string of lights is the naughty one this morning. This string of lights has a chunk that does not want to light up. And what I know about lights is not a lot, but I know enough to realize that when there is a bulb that burns out, it prevents electricity from flowing from one end of the string of lights to the other, and it can cause the whole string sometimes to simply not work. Let me tell you, that's a headache when you've got them already put up on the roof. But as I was thinking about that, I got to thinking about Advent, and I realized that's how Advent is sort of supposed to operate for us. This is the, the changing of a bulb sometimes for many of us, as a new year in the Christian faith. Our relationship with God, as we talk about from Isaiah this morning, talks about how our relationship was broken. In many ways, it's sort of like the, the conduit between God and his people had sort of been uh, shut down. Sort of like a string of lights with a bad bulb. Advent is the opportunity for us to come back to God, to replace that bulb so that that relationship once again is, is realigned with what God is aiming to do. And we're going to hear a little bit about that here shortly. But these Christmas lights are a reminder for us that the light of the world came into our lives, and we need to make sure that it is shining and doing all we can to keep those bulbs from burning out. Let's have a word of prayer. God, we thank you for sending Jesus, the light of the world, into this dark place so many years ago. And God, as that light shines in us, help us to keep it burning bright, that we would not turn from you, that we would not stray from your word, but that we would shine so brightly that others would come from miles away to see just what is burning so brightly in our lives, to desire the same thing, to come to the manger and to meet their Savior there. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, I remember a lot about my Christmases from growing up. I remember spending Christmas morning ripping apart the wrapped packages beneath the Christmas tree. I remember the fun of all the time spent together as a family. I also remember that when we would finish up at our own home, whether it would be the same day or maybe a day or two after, we would load up into the car all together and journey to my grandmother's house an hour and a half or so away in Bedford, Pennsylvania. There we would enjoy a second Christmas of sorts, but my pappy was always so excited about another thing underneath the Christmas tree. The presents would be set elsewhere nearby the tree so that his trains would be visible. Pappy would always enjoy watching my and my siblings' faces light up as we would watch and study every detail he had placed into his little table train set there under the tree. Now I know he loved seeing those smiles while we all took it in because he would sit and his face would glow as he watched us watch his handiwork. I don't know exactly how much time he spent putting it all together, but I know that while he could, he would make sure it was always ready for us to see. Now, I'm certainly not a model train expert of any sorts, but I know my grandfather had to be diligent and meticulous to some degree to make sure that it all worked properly so that the train would not jump off the tracks or simply sit and not go at all. In preparing to look at our time of Advent together today, I, I read a little bit more about these classic train sets of which my grandfather used under the tree, and I found out something really interesting about them. Some train sets, especially back in the 60s and 70s, and even up till today, require a lot of attention to detail, or they don't work. 
Now, the tracks easily line up. They're designed to line up very, very well. But lining everything else up can be a little trickier. You see, the wheels of not only the engine car on the front of the train set has to be lined up, but every single car behind it has to be lined up just right on some of these train sets, or it can easily jump the track and completely go overboard. You would think it'd be kind of foolproof, but it's not. Now, one solution that a lot of folks would find, including my grandfather, is that once he laid the tracks down, he would staple them to whatever wooden surface he had them on. That prevented the train tracks from moving around or shifting as the train was running over them or while he was moving it to the place he wanted it to be. But there's something else that was just as important as anything to keep that train from derailing or not working. And that was a special little piece called the re-railer. This piece not only connected the train to its electrical source, it was the point at which the wires would run into the tracks to provide the electrical power to the train, but more importantly, every time that train would run over the re-railer, it would make sure that those wheels were properly aligned to the track to keep it from coming off. I don't recall if my grandfather ever pointed out to me how his train set actually ran, but I'm almost certain he knew the value of having that re-railer piece set up properly to help keep those trains running smoothly so it never got off track. As we begin our Advent journey together through the weeks of Advent, I would like us all to think of this season, this month, these four Sundays and extra Christmas Eve service that we have as our opportunity to realign ourselves with God to make sure our wheels spiritually are on track properly. Our scripture today doesn't really feel so warm and fuzzy like we might typically think of when it comes to this season. Isaiah 64 verses 1 to 9 has a more of difficult tone to it. And as we read it, one of the things that we might think about is how it sort of reads like a legal document or legal resolution put forward for ramification. Whereas the Lord would rip open the heavens and descend, make the mountains shudder at your presence. And whereas when a forest catches fire, as when fire makes a pot to boil to shock your enemies into facing you, make the nations shake in their boots. And whereas you did terrible things we never expected, descended and made the mountains shudder at your presence, and whereas, since before time began, no one has ever imagined, no one heard, no eye seen, a God like you who works for those who wait for him. And whereas you meet those who happily do what is right, who keep a good memory of the way you work. And whereas you have been angry with us, and whereas we have sinned and kept at it so long, and whereas we are all sin-infected, sin-contaminated, and whereas our best efforts are grease-stained rags, and whereas we dry up like autumn leaves, sin-dried, blown off by the wind, and whereas no one prays to you or makes the effort to reach out to you because you've turned away from us, left us to stew in our sins, and whereas still, God, we know you as Father, we're the clay, you are our potter. All of us are what you made us. Therefore, be it resolved, we, your people, ask that you be not too angry with us, O God. We ask that you not keep a permanent record of our wrongdoing. We implore you to keep in mind Please, that we are your people, all of us. Don Chesser, in adapting a prayer found in our own United Methodist hymnal, puts it this way. We begin the season of Advent acknowledging our estrangement from our Creator. We acknowledge God's anger and absence. And we confess our complicity in the situation. God has a right to be angry because we, God's people, have sinned against God 
and one another. We have not loved God with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done God's will. We have broken God's law. We have rebelled against God's love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. In other words, we start our Advent time together admitting that each of us in our own way has walked away from the Father's home as prodigal sons and daughters. We have failed to let our hearts stay on the tracks. And we need to once again come home to God in order to re-rail our spirits to His purposes for our lives. Every single one of us knows what it's like to come home after a long time away. There's a sense of rest, rejuvenation, and refocusing that happens because we are finally home again. Now, would it be possible to run an electric train set without that re-railer piece to help reset the train every pass? Yes, absolutely, because there are other ways to make sure the electricity gets to the train. However, does it make good sense to do so? Not so much. The tracks and the train wheels, though built to scale, are imperfect. Motion and expansion and contraction over time because of the heat introduced by the electricity and friction will eventually separate the tracks unevenly. Even if electricity still flows, this will cause the wheels to start derailing frequently. Having a re-railer in the circuit helps put the wheels back on track even if they have started to stray. In the same way, the church can see Advent as the way and time of year where we can once again refocus our attention to what keeps us in line with God's will. Advent comes around year after year after year to bring the whole church back into the singular focus on that one thing that unifies us all, the birth of our Lord, Jesus Christ. This season of Advent points us toward the culmination of all things in Christ as the north star of our lives as individuals, as congregations, as denominations, and even as the church all around the world. As we are reminded throughout this season again and again of where God intends to lead us all, we are enabled to get our lives realigned with the purposes and challenges of living in God's kingdom here and now. We also become more aware of the disjunction between where we are and where God longs and works in our lives for us to be. We are also realigned with God's intention to meet us where we are, to fill us with joy, and to do everything possible here and now through us to make this world more closely approximate to what God is longing for it to become. And there's no better place to focus and reset our attention to God than in a place we call home. I think Perry Como said it best when he sang, Oh, there's no place like home for the holidays, because no matter how far away you roam, when you pine for the sunshine of a friendly gaze, for the holidays you can't beat home, sweet home. So let's go home to God acknowledging our broken, prodigal ways, and find mercy in the manger that helps us realign with what He has in store for each and every one of us. Amen.